Scene 2 in my version of King Lear, which is the Oxford World Classics, is Act 1, Scene 2, if you've got a different version. And it begins with Edmund speaking, so it's Edmund's sort of soliloquy um, to the audience. He's on stage in the first scene, but he doesn't actually speak, he doesn't actually say anything. So this really emphasises just how duplicitous he is, you know, he can stay silent, like Cordelia saying nothing, but then, you know, it's revealed. And actually his, his true nature is revealed to the audience. So although, you know, Ed, Edmund is clearly this Machiavellian cruel character, there's a sense in which we're sort of complicit in it. Um, Nuttall talks about in, in his essay about the sort of pleasure of tragedy and I think this is a great example of that where we sort of take pleasure at this stage in Edmund and in, and in what he says. He's referred to as Edmund the Bastard in the stage directions. The Bastard was a stock um, character in, in Jacobean, well Elizabethan and Jacobean uh, theatre. The idea was in this quite Christian nation that if you had a child out of wedlock, a, a bastard, that they would almost come back to bite you, that your sins would come back to sort of get you. And, and here Edmund is that, that character, you know, the bastard role. But what's interesting is he takes that on. He says, you know what, well, yeah, OK, if I am a bastard, that's what I'll be. And I will actually use that against everyone. He owns that sort of character that is often quite a, quite a sort of stock role. He opens by saying, no, nature, oh my goddess. So he's not. Um, praying to a god, he's basically saying, you know, I'll make it my own way. It doesn't mean nature as in mother nature. It's this sense of, of, of the corrupt world that he draws upon. You know, the idea that Shakespeare suggests that uh, Machiavellianism is, is, is bred by the, the corruption of the world that's there anyway. He says, to, the, to thy law, my services are bound. You know, he is bound to do this. He is trapped. He, he, this is his role. He's, he's a bastard. That's what he does. He then talks about the plague of custom in his third line. Again, the idea that he is like a plague. He is a punishment to be... Um, acted out on Gloucester. But not only is Edmund that, he knows he's that, and he's doing this sort of self-consciously. Um, he says, lag of a brother, why bastard, why base, about line uh, six. So we've got all those plosives, all those words starting with B, very harsh sounding. But again, it's Edmund acknowledging what he is. He's saying, you know what, if that's what you want to call me, I'll take that on. Um, he goes on saying, my mind is generous and my shape is true as, as honest madam's issue. Basically, you know, I, I am the same type of, of person as, as, as my brother the only difference is what I've been assigned and um, Shakespeare opens that, that up you know is it actually that Edmund has been assigned the role of bastard and that's why therefore he's, he's ended up uh, you know being being bad I guess um, he talks about line 15 16 legitimate Edgar so again the set up as these opposites there's illegitimate Edmund and, and legitimate Edgar and then at the end of the soliloquy, he ends with, now God stand up for bastards. Now, obviously, it's God's not God. Um, this isn't a religious reading. If This is a, a, a time before that. But there's there's that sense of, of, of Edmund saying, you know what? Yeah, you know, be, be on my side. And it's, it's what Castan talks about. There's no single answer here. A religious reading doesn't quite work because actually um, it, 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 Ed, Edmund is taking on the role of bastards. He's saying, yeah, you know what? That's what I'll be. Um, you know, no single reading of this play quite works out. Um and then Edmund has a letter of, of, of words he's written against Gloucester, against his father. Gloucester says, you know, what, why are you hiding this letter about line 27? And Edmund says, well, well I found it. it, it's off Edgar. So Edmund uses his own words to kind of get Ed, Edgar into trouble. So again, it's Edmund owning that role of bastard to um, to, to get what he wants. Later on, actually, um, it, it, it's letters that are sent between Goneril and Regan and Edmund that, that are his undoing. So um, letters go from being something that Edmund sort of, you know, takes advantage of to something that actually is, is his undoing. When Gloucester asks him, Edmund says, nothing, my lord. So we've got that echo with Cordelia. Both of them are a product of the new world. It's not as simple as the new world being good or bad. The new world has bred Machiavelli and it's bred Edmund, but it's also bred Cordelia, the more domestic, more um, idealised Jacobean woman. Um, Gloucester says no it can't be nothing because you know if, if it's nothing you won't be so keen to hide it just like Leah nothing will come of nothing there's these echoes between them um, and Gloucester reads and the letter starts on about line 45 this policy of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times again it's about his age Gloucester and Leah are set up as these ageing patriarchs who need to almost be, be, be stopped it's not it's not saying that Ed, Edmund is, is fully right but there's a sense that they have bred their own downfall quite literally bred it um, on line 55, Gloucester says, have your hand to write this and a heart and a brain to breed it in. So there's that idea of, of, of breeding, this sense that, that Edmund is is, is the, the unnatural, ungodly plague, you know, on, on his dad. Gloucester's words that he's speaking about Edgar are ironically true of Edmund. Um, Gloucester on line 75, a bored villain, unnatural, detested. Again, it's against it's, it's a going against nature. Um, but ironically, as Edmund just said at the start of his soliloquy, th this is a time when nature's breaking down, the world is corrupt, those things aren't quite working. 
Um, from memory, I think it's Komodo who talks about language breaks down because this is a world where everything sort of breaks down. Um, and then we get over to, to page 120. Um, Gloucester says, you know, about line 95 to his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Again, just like the God and Regan have gone against the king, Edmund is going against his, his dad. There's that idea of these old patriarchs with the world turning against them. Um, and that sense of, of a natural change in the world is back to line 101. Gloucester says these late eclipses in the sun and moon pretend no good to us. Everything is changing. This is a, a natural world in itself. Everything is sort of shifting. The world's changing on its, on its uh, axes. Um, when, he, when his father re exits, Edmund sort of mocks the idea of religion, basically, about line 112, as if we were villains by necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, basically saying the gods and the stars and the sun doesn't, doesn't affect you, you make your own way in the world. Again, it's Machiavellian ideas, Edmund saying, no, we, we're not defined, we make our own way. Okay, so ironic when he's been called a, a bastard in his first entrance, but he's actually saying, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll own that, I'll, I will become that if that's what I need to do. Um, and then Edgar enters about line 124 and Edmund then says, and out he comes, like the catastrophe of the, of the old comedy. It's like Edmund is directing this play. Edgar enters the stage and Edmund's standing there going, oh, here he is, he is this, this other character. So Edmund is, is taking charge of these theatrical conventions. These theatrical conventions have made him the villainous, the bastard. And now he's taking ownership of that and saying, yeah, you know what, I'm going to direct this play. I'm going to make this a play where the bastard can sort of win because things are, are changing so much. Um, uh, and, and then we get Edmund, um, when Edgar exits about line 160, he says, I do serve you in this business, a credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none. Again, Ed, Edmund is, is challenging this idea of nature. The idea that, that Edgar is the natural son, the um, child that has been born, you know, of, of a marriage, the legitimate son. Edmund is mocking that, you know, yeah, his nature actually is um, foolish. It's naive. It's part of the old system. Edmund says the world has changed, you know, it's an unnatural world and I pray to, to a nature in my sense of, the, of this changed world. Um, interesting actually that, that Edgar has to sort of break down, Edgar has to become poor Tom before he's almost reborn to be a, a hero who can actually keep up with the new world. At this stage he can't, he's part of the old system, he's naive, he's a patriarch to be. Um, it's only when he becomes poor Tom and his language breaks down that he's allowed to then be reborn as a different character. Uh, and then scene three, we get Goneril basically moaning about Leah's knights. Bet line five says his knights grow riotous. There's different versions of this that, that directors will choose to portray. In some versions, the knights are riotous and we see Goneril's point. In other versions, the knights are noble and we don't. Um, and it just shows really how a director's decision can really change and shape what we think about Goneril. Has she got a point or not? Um, and then about line 14, she says, if you dislike it, let him to our sister. Basically saying, you know, I know that Regan will do exactly the same thing again. They're the same, they're part of this new world. Um, she says, idle old man that would still, that still would manage the, those authorities that he hath given away. Again, the idea is that the world is an unnatural place at the moment. Lear has given away his power and yet wants to keep his power. Um, Goneril draws attention to that paradox that we've got there. And then she continues that line 19, old fools are babes again. Okay, the idea that these old patriarchs are becoming stupid, they're becoming naive, they're becoming like babies. Again, though, that sets up this imagery of rebirth. Edgar, in many ways, is an old fool who becomes a babe again. He's reborn, he re-emerges Edgar, and he can keep up. And that imagery is kind of echoed as the play progresses. So that's uh, scene three, which is very short, which in your version may be act one, scene three. But in mine, the Oxford World Classics is just scene three.